Good morning and welcome to the HR Congress podcast. Today we'll be featuring a session that was recorded at the Digital HR Innovation Summit 2019 in Amsterdam. The session is about leadership in the digital era and it's presented by Dr. Jennifer Jordan, Professor of Leadership and Organizational Behavior at IMD Business School. Our podcast schedule will return to normal from next week onwards Given that the coronavirus situation has taken precedence over many business functions, it's been a little delayed, so we apologize for that, but it will return to normal very soon, so stay tuned. Enjoy this particularly relevant session for today, and make sure you subscribe to keep up to date with the latest information from around the world of work. Thank you for inviting me. It's truly a pleasure to be here. Um, and it is a pleasure and a privilege, I think, uh, both because I get to talk about the topic that I'm most passionate about. And, and Philip, you mentioned uh, ethics. It's interesting, as a professor of leadership, so I left uh, school in 2005. And I was just, when I was going through my PhD, it was the Enron and the WorldCom scandals going on in the US. And so I was, I'm, I'm American by birth. I've lived out of the US quite some time, uh, but it was, it was a time when we were thinking a lot about ethics. And so when I left graduate school, the primary topic that I taught on and I did research on with, was ethics and morality. And every school wanted a teacher to teach ethics. And then a couple of years passed by and people forgot about ethics. We don't really think it's so much about ethics or responsible leadership anymore. And what I learned from that experience is that being a leadership professor is a bit like being a dietitian. In the diet industry, if we think about 10 years back, they told you, right, don't touch any carbo, uh, don't touch any fat. Eat really low fat, um, eat, uh, you know, don't, don't touch any high protein, no steaks. And then a few years later, it was the Atkins diet and it was only eat steaks, don't touch a piece of bread because even if you take like a little piece of the crust, you're gonna blow up like a balloon. And then I was, I was taught, you know, you should eat small meals every three hours. And now it's like, I think you should fast for 12 hours or something like that, right? So as a, di as a, as a, as a diner, you sit down at the table and you wonder to yourself, what should I eat? And should I even be eating now? Well, it's a bit of the same situation with being a leadership professor. So in my career, as I said, when I left graduate school, it was all about ethics. We were worried about responsible leadership and there were many uh, opportunities to teach and do research on this. And people kind of forgot about ethics. We've had, since then, we've had charismatic leadership. We've had servant leadership. Um, we've had authentic leadership. And I worry it's the same issue for leaders. They walk into the office and they think, what does it really mean to lead? What should I, what should I do? Uh, should I be the charismatic servant, which I'm not even sure what that means. And so when IMD, I've been teaching now at IMD for three years, and I got the question more and more from clients, what is leadership like in the digital age and how is it different from leadership before? And it was very frustrating for me because I couldn't answer that question. I didn't have the data and I didn't know anyone else who had the data. But what I was very, very careful of is not merely packaging old wine in new bottles having a new trend, like digital leadership is completely new. It's something that leaders have never seen before and we're gonna sell it as such. But I also didn't have that answer. I didn't know if it was completely new. And so in the last two years, I've been privileged to work with our Cisco Center for Digital Transformation at IMD researching this question. So 80% of the research I do right now, I still do my stuff on, on power and influence and ethics, um, but 80% is in this area of what does it mean to lead in the digital age. And that is what I will be presenting here today. Super short snippet on, on what I'm doing. So uh, we try to answer this question or we're in the process of answering it because research is always ongoing. And we did so through several different means. One was quantitative. So we have data from over a thousand leaders who are working in areas of um, either in digital companies or companies that are being digitally disrupted. And we looked at what are the competencies as well as traits, although I'll tell you why we're only focusing on competencies now. What are the competencies and traits that are predictive of success as rated by their peers in these environments? 
We also did several in-depth interviews of leaders at these companies saying, what competencies do you see as being successful? And then we've done a number of case studies. Right now, the model looks like this. Humble, accepting that others know more than me, so being open to learning. In an age of digital disruption, it's not necessarily the leaders that need to know the technical skills and the technical competencies, but more about the minds that they bring. And I'll talk more about that later on because we did look at that as well. How important is it for leaders to know and be familiar and to be competent in some of the more technical areas as well? So humble, accepting that others know more than me. Adaptable, changing my mind is a strength, not a weakness. Visionary. A clear vision is more important than a detailed plan. Engage, always being in listening mode. So that's often a big change for leaders, being a better, a better listener rather than a teller. In the center, we have three competencies, which is informed decision-making, fast execution, and then hyper-awareness, which is being aware of threats internally and externally in one's environment or industry. And I said, in the, when we first started on this journey of doing the research, we looked at both traits and competencies. But over time, we actually took out the traits. And here's why. At IMD, our job is to develop people. You and HR might actually be quite interested in the traits because for selection, that's quite relevant. But we're interested in competencies that can be developed. And traits are much more um, stable. They're not changeable. So that's why we've developed a competency model, but I'm happy at the end, I, I'll show my email address, and I'm happy to talk with you if you're curious about some of the traits we looked at as well, uh, to discuss those with you. I'm gonna describe, in the, in the short time we have together, I'll describe this model, what we mean by these seven competencies. So I'm gonna start with my favorite, humility. Um, acceptance that others know more than me, and I start with this one because when we have a 360 assessment, on these seven competencies. And we give it to leaders, especially leaders at the top of the hierarchy. This is one that normally comes out the lowest. So being open to learning and being open to understanding. I'm gonna play a video right now with Tim Westergren. There's a, a learning that I feel that I've had through this uh, path that I learn and relearn over and over again. And that seems to be this truism uh, through all the years, and that is to me uh, the value of humility, uh, which when you, when you run a business, you're faced with an enormous amount of uncertainty uh, and experimentation. It's an adventure, uh, and you really don't know what you're doing. Uh, you learn it in the doing of it. I think it's like being in a car driving at night on a windy road, you know, it just sort of unfolds in front of you. And I think there's no more important uh, characteristic to bring to that than humility, to sort of know that you don't know pretty much what you're doing, and it starts with people sitting next to you. You have to, I think, by example, uh, you know, embrace a really horizontal, um, respectful work environment. And, and I think the more you inject hierarchy into the office, whether it's in the form of physical structures or, or titles or whatnot, you know, the harder it is to kind of retain that sort of humble uh, thread. And I really do think that people are very, very motivated by leaders who they view as humble. Um, I think it's, a, it's an inspiring uh, attribute. You want to work for someone like that, and more importantly, you model that for people that work for you. So if you do that as a leader, you, you build humble leaders who then, in turn, I think, build motivated teams. And that's not that's different from confidence and aggression you know being aggressive and ambitious those are perfectly uh, symbiotic but i think underneath that all if you retain humility or you know you have a, a good shot at it so tim as you may have seen there he was the ceo of um pandora so you might know uh, he stepped down in 2016 pandora one of the largest streaming radio stations in the world american based what I like about this video is two things he says about humility. One, people want to work for humble leaders, which we find as well, especially millennials. And a, a large area that, of research that we do right now is on millennials and leadership. What is really unique about them? What is unique about what they're looking for in organizations? Um, and then the second thing is, is that humility is not uh, is symbiotic or is not opposed to traits like ambitious, 
um, competitive. So we often think when we use the word humble, it's kind of a soft term. Oh, someone's very humble. But actually, you can be humble and also very aggressive and very competitive. And we find in the digital age, you need to have that humility um, in order to go forward. And Gordon mentioned this unlearning and relearning. Uh, I do believe that that is a competency. So this is one of my one of my favorite quotes that I've seen recently. I saw it on a calendar. And so I took a photo of it, but I think it's brilliant. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. And I think it's so true. And we see with leaders, and, and it, I, I get it, right? I see also IMD, we're in the middle of a digital vortex. We're being disrupted. Uh, for those of you, I'm guessing you work with a lot of providers around executive education. People are expecting something very different from executive education. Um, there's are many more providers out there on the market. And it's very threatening as a professor or anyone who's developed, who's spent many years, a lot of hard work developing an expertise, and then all of a sudden to be told, you have to change. And what you learned is obsolete. That's really tough. Um, so I, I get that. But I also realize that this is a necessary trait in order to go forward for the future. So humble, an ability to accept feedback and acknowledge that others know more than you. And so, as I said in our, in our quantitative study, we looked at leaders that were rated by their peers as either successful or unsuccessful. We call them the agile. And uh, the non-agile leaders, agile is kind of a buzz term, but that's what we labeled them here. Uh, and we found that the leaders that were rated by their peers as being successful in the environment reported things like challenging their own assumptions, gathering ideas from their team, allowing their team to coach them, and having their team encourage them uh, to challenge their opinions. Okay, so humility was the first competency we looked at. Adaptable. Changing my mind is a strength, not a weakness. And by the way, humble and adaptable tend to go together. Um, they're positively correlated, so leaders that are, are humble or open to learning are also more likely to see that change in the self is a, is a strength, not a weakness. Um, here we see, again, if we look at the agile leaders and the non-agile leaders, I adapt my behavior to new circumstances. I change my mind in front of my team if they convince me. So we often think that Steve Jobs, he wasn't an agile, uh, an, an adaptable leader. He had an idea of where he wanted to go, and he was actually very stubborn. Un unwilling to change his mind. But actually, if you look at a lot of the decisions that he made or that were made that turned Apple around, they showed a lot of adaptability. So for example, if we look at what led to the resurgence of Apple at the early part of the century, it was the creation of these, I don't know if you remember them, these iMacs. They were these colorful Macintosh computers that came in blue and teal and purple and orange. And Steve Jobs thought that was ridiculous. He said, who's going to want a pink computer? And it was not until he listened to Jonathan Ive, who's currently still the design, uh, the head of design at Apple, who said, no, the future is that we need to create technology that's an extension of the self, that people see their identity in their computer. And that was not something that was Steve Jobs' initial idea. And then from that, uh, Jonathan Ives also created the iPod, et cetera. But Steve Jobs, if, if he was given evidence that his idea was not correct, he was actually quite adaptable. So we have humble, we have adaptable. The fourth one is visionary. And as I said, this is ongoing research. The next part of the, of the research that I would like to try to answer is how this model changes along the hierarchy. So my hypothesis is that this model might look a little bit different for people that are members of the top management team, members of the top of the organization, rather than middle managers and line managers. Maybe not that the competencies are going to change, but the weightings of these competencies might be different. And in my experience, visionary, or what the data is actually showing or pointing to now is for leaders at the top, having a clear vision for the future is one of the most important competencies that they can have. And that has a lot to do with the fact that life is changing faster. And so you might need to be adaptable on how you get there, but you also need to have a clear vision on where you're going. So having a clear sense of long-term direction, even in the face of long-term, uh, short-term uncertainty. And I think a company that, and a leader, that embodies this idea of vision very beautifully is Lego. 
So I'm guessing that you know a little bit, or many of you know the story of Lego. So they were suffering quite severely around 2005 or so, the, uh, five years after the, the turn of the century, losing about 30% of profits every year, so really bleeding money, bleeding cash. And it was largely, this is Niels Christensen, the current CEO, but also the CEO that preceded him that said, okay, we have to come back to our roots. We have to understand our customer. So I'm going to use that word customer centricity, even though uh, Gordon kind of poo pooed it. So we have to understand our customer. We have to come back to our core product. They had done before that, they had tried many different things. They had tried opening theme parks, which were a complete failure. They had tried doing Lego clothing, also a failure. When they came back to the saying, okay, what is the play of the future look like? What are children wanting? Did they, uh, were they successful? So they actually took out over half the products about 10 years ago, and that actually also started to help the company move forward. But I like this quote from Niels, the current uh, CEO, that says, we want to pioneer new ways of playing, play materials in the business models of play, leveraging globalization and digitalization. It's not just about products, it's about realizing the human possibility. It's a vision for the future. He doesn't exactly say how he's gonna get there, right? Not a detailed plan, but knowing where we want to go as an organization. Number four, informed decision-making. Making use of data and information to make evidence-based decisions. So we have making informed decisions. We know, of course, Google uses data. That's one of their main uh, uh, value propositions is how they use data and the extent to which they use it, the details of which they use it. Facebook is the same, but many other companies are starting to use data more wisely as well. Ahold del Haas, it's a Dutch, Dutch uh, Belgian company. So Bart Born runs the AI lab at uh, Aholt, and they're doing a lot of work around um, artificial intelligence, predicting people's behavior around shopping, but not only at Aholt, but many supermarkets. We have a Migro in, in Switzerland, which is where I live now, also having these handheld devices. Now, of course, if you've ever used, who's used one of these at the supermarket? You go through, you scan your loyalty card, right? You, you grab one of these uh, little scanners, you walk around the store. It's very convenient for the user because you get out more quickly from the store, you don't have to stand in line. But what the stores are trying to collect data on is not only what people buy, that's obvious, but how they navigate the stores. So based on how people move around, what they buy, new stores are being designed based on data, on people's past behavior, on how people shop, in terms of the movement in the store. And as I said, they're not only interested in what people buy, but what people don't buy. So when someone scans an item, and then takes it off of the scanner, they remove it and they put it back on the shelf. Stores are interested in what do they buy in replacement of this? So are they buying something of a lower price? Is it a price choice? Is it a quality choice? Are they going for something that, for example, is more natural or uh, bio? So what are people choosing to switch out in their, in their behavior? Uh, Amazon, another uh, similar industry, um, uh, bought Whole Foods in the US one of the largest health food chains, uh, store chains in the world, actually. And the reason that uh, Jeff Bezos said that he bought Whole Foods is because they didn't have a loyalty program. He said they were losing a lot of data that they could capture around how people think about and buy health foods and think about health care. About three months after buying Whole Foods, he announced that he was uh, entering the health care market. Probably not a surprise. And then, as I mentioned, we're working with Novartis. Novartis has what is called the NERV project. So at any one time, Novartis is running about 500 clinical trials. In the past, they were losing a lot of money on their clinical trials because they were not able to keep in touch or to keep track of where these clinical trials were in the process that they should be. And so some clinical trials didn't have enough people signed up. They had started too late, and therefore they weren't completed in time to receive. Some of them received government funding, et cetera, as well as, as the Novartis funding. And so what the NERV project does now, it allows uh, in real time for them to track enrollment numbers, where they are in terms of distribution of the medicine to the, the potential participants. And so they can know almost immediately when a project is falling behind and intervene before it gets too late. And they found that this is saving them a lot of money in order to be able to track this in real time. So the downside of using data, of course we can make fast decisions, 
once we have considered a 4,872 factors. So one of the downsides of using data is that it often slows us down. And in a time of digital disruption, speed, as you see in this model, fast execution is quite important. And these two competencies, by the way, in most people, tend to be negatively correlated. People that are really good at fast execution tend to be more gut-oriented. They tend to go more with their intuition. And people that use data are very analytical, but they tend to also be slower sometimes. And so we find that the leaders that are really successful in the digital age are the ones who are able to manage that tension. Be able to act at speed, but also be able to uh, use data wisely. So fast execution, the willingness to move quickly, often valuing speed over perfection. This is a really tough one, depending on your industry. So for example, we, use, uh, we work closely with an airplane engine manufacturer. It's really hard in that industry. Where can you sacrifice perfection? Do you want to tell your clients that, it, that are buying your uh, airplane engines, oh yeah, we really, we sacrifice perfection uh, over speed. It doesn't work, right? So where can you act quickly? What are these uh, areas of fast fail, depending on your industry or even pharmaceuticals, right? Can you really sacrifice perfection in pharmaceuticals? The tough tension between these two uh, characteristics. This is a picture from KPN. They're, doing a, they're going through a fairly large digital transformation. They have this separate arm where they have 35, at least when we wrote the case, with 35 scrum teams. Here's a picture of one of the floors where the scrum teams are working. It's getting, becoming very popular in my workshop. I, I asked for an example. There was a woman, Ksenia from PMI, who was talking about how they're using it outside of the software industry in HR actually, using Scrum methodology. But Scrum is based on the lean startup model of build, measure, learn. Building a minimally viable product, measuring what are the benefits and the weaknesses, and learning from that, and then repeating the cycle. Classically in Scrum, it's a two-week cycle, uh, but that has been adjusted. So Ksenia was sharing with us, for them, it's a three-month cycle that they've adjusted this to. But still, can you, can you kind of go through the cycle where you develop something quick, fast-fail options, and learn from that and build again. And I, I, I have, uh, if anyone knows the Scrum Manifesto, it's 12 points that you're supposed to follow with Scrum. I have number 10 on my office wall. I think it's extremely important and extremely difficult in organizations. Simplicity. The art of maximizing the work not done is essential. So what speed is about, right? Or what allows us to be speedy is really focusing on the goal of where we want to go and not being distracted and not being disoriented from where our area of focus or area of expertise is. And I think in organizations, that's one thing that startups have an advantage over, big organizations. They're, really, they're bringing in experts who are really good at what they do, and they allow those experts to work on only what they're good at. And it does allow for speed. Engage. So now I, I promised I would go back outside of the, the inside. Engage. I'm always in listening mode. A willingness to listen, interact, and communicate with internal and external stakeholders combined with a strong sense of interest and curiosity in emerging trends. I'm going to play a video now. Um, this is Angela Renz, the former CEO of, of uh, Burberry in the UK. She left in 2014, went to Apple, was head of retail, left I think two months ago from Apple, and it's very Strange. I'm not sure why she departed. There was almost no communication about it. I'm not sure what she's doing now. But she, this is a video that was taken of her uh, in an interview when she was still at Burberry. So she's going to talk about engagement. Uh, what advice would you give a new chief executive? Listen. I you know it's... Uh, you think back and you think that... Uh, I was very fortunate to have a six-month transition period with my predecessor. And it's funny because if I would have implemented everything that I thought about the, the first 30, 60 days, um, you know, I can't imagine where we'd be. So they ask Angela, what is the most important quality? And she says to be a good listener. If I had implemented what I thought when I first started, we wouldn't be where we are. And I think that's a really interesting statement for a CEO to say, right? It's not oftentimes, in my workshop, we talked about the differences in leadership in the pre-digital and digital age. At least 10 years ago, we talked more for, for executives about executive presence. What do you tell? How do you, how do you communicate? And now we're finding with executives, 
they have to step back and be better listeners, which is also a huge shift. Um, so engaged, always being in listening mode, a related competency, hyper-awareness, constant scanning of the internal and external environments for opportunities and threats. Are you aware kind of a, someone used a great term in, in the workshop of helicopter view. Are you able to kind of see the big picture not only in your industry but also outside? And this is very important as we come into a world with more disruptors. Do we know what's happening outside that might still affect what we're doing inside? And so I, I, I saw this, um, this was a few months ago. It was an interview with James, James Gorman, the CEO of Morgan Stanley, and it was about robo-advisors. And he pretty much in this whole interview dismisses robo-advisors. Yeah, they're not going to, as he says here, uh, where judgment, trust, and emotion play a big role, it's hard to imagine humans not being at the core of that. Uh, it makes no sense to me at all. Okay, so he doesn't think this is going to disrupt his business. I turn the page, and it's an article on Fidelity, another investment bank, investing in a stock app that a 10-year-old made, which advises people on buying stocks. So yes, it's like for you in your industry and the people maybe that you, your reference point, maybe they wouldn't use digital advisors or robo-advisors. But if we think about what is, if we're hyper-aware, we think about beyond just our generation, beyond our comfort zone, beyond our reference group, our social reference group, our gender reference group, our generational reference group, maybe it is relevant. And leaders need to have this hyper-awareness. And many leaders themselves don't necessarily have that hyper-awareness, but they build a network around them that allows them to be more hyper-aware. And I talked also in the workshop about the importance we see in what I call network leadership, developing a network around you that ameliorates your weaknesses. Some of those can be leadership weaknesses, but they can also be technical competencies or technical uh, skills that you yourself don't have. So in closing, we know that there are three things that leaders need to be successful. One, they need to have the skills or the competencies that are needed to be successful in their environment. The second is a context that fosters these skills or encourages these skills. But the third and equally important is a belief that you can lead or accomplish your goals. And this is what is known as self-efficacy. And a lot of leaders, when they come to IMD and they do a program on leading in the digital age, or leading in a time of digital disruption, they're like, oh, this is not me. I'm not a generation, I'm not a millennial, I'm not even a generation X, I'm a baby boomer. I didn't grow up, I'm not a digital native. This is not comfortable for me. And what I hope after this talk, or when I hope after one of our programs, what you or they understand is yes, these might be the digital leaders, Tim Westergren, Angela Renz, Niels Christensen. By the way, none of these except this guy, he's quite a techie. Angela or Niels and many others, they're not techies by, uh, by trait or by, by trade. That's not their background. Angela came from the fashion industry. Niels had a very much a corporate background. He wasn't a techie in any way. But they had the competencies, the human mindsets, as Gordon used the term my, uh, mindset. They had the human mindset needed to make these changes and to be successful. So I hope when you ask yourself, who are the digital leaders, you see that it can be you or the people that you work with. It's not someone who has a, you know, who knows Python or who uh, can understand and explain Bitcoin, et cetera. Uh, and so when we look, come back to this model of seven traits, none of these, going back to, you know, selling old wine and new bottles, none of these are competencies, I'm sorry, not traits, competencies that you've probably never seen before. You know what humility is. Uh, you know what it means to be adaptable. You know what it means to be a good listener. They're not some kind of alien traits. But the question is now, how do we start developing them and encouraging them in our organization?